All right, well, let's let's get started and um, folks may continue to join here. Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Galen Barbos. I'm joined by my colleague, Eric O'Shaughnessy, and we're uh, excited to have you here today to share the results from a paper that we recently published uh, on the role of peer influence in rooftop solar adoption inequity in the United States. Uh, this is a paper that uh, came out in the journal Energy Economics, um, uh, but it's published in open access form, so um, anybody can can download it and read that that article. Um, and we've included a, a link on our website where you can can access the journal uh, publication. Um, before we get started here, I want to just kind of go through a few housekeeping items and also give a little bit of context and background on the work uh, that we're going to talk about here today. Uh, first, as far as the housekeeping items go, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will post the recording along with the slides on the website. Uh, we'll try to remember to send an email out to everybody who registered uh, in a day or so. Uh, just letting you know where you can find that, but it it will basically be the, in the same spot on our website where the publication itself is posted. Uh, second item is that we will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Um, I think the presentation itself might only be 20 or 25 minutes long. So um, we've got lots of time for Q&A, so please enter any questions that you might have along the way in the Q&A box that hopefully you all see. Um, I'll be uh, compiling those questions as we go, and uh, we'll be emceeing the, the Q&A session at the end. Uh, so please enter those in. Um, so now just to provide a little bit of the context behind this work, um, uh, here at LBL, we have been doing uh, research for a number of years now focused on issues related to uh, equity and access in the rooftop solar market in the United States. Uh, one of the foundational elements in that work is an annual report that we put out that, as it happens, just came out today. Um, and that report really is focused on describing income and other demographic trends uh, among roof, residential rooftop solar adopters in the United States. And, and that, that tracking report uh, involves the collection and development of a very rich underlying data set. Um, and we've used that data set then for a variety of different analyses over the years where we've really sought to kind of dive deeper into the causes and potential solutions to uh, inequities in, in the rooftop solar market. And so the paper that we'll be presenting here today is, is very much an example of that, where we've taken this data that we uh, have, have developed for the annual report and put it to use within the context of a kind of more uh, a, a deeper, more focused analysis, in this case, looking at the impact of, of peer influence. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand things over to my colleague, Eric, and Eric is going to walk us through the deck. Eric, take it away. Great. Thanks, Galen. Uh, so as Galen mentioned, this is uh, published. So any details you don't pick up here, uh, you can find this paper. It's the same title showed, shown here. Uh, all right, flash a disclaimer in front of you. And to start with the summary up front, just to level set and kind of you know, avoid bearing the lead. Uh, the summary here, the context uh, demand for emerging technologies is often influenced by the adoption decisions of peers uh, and rooftop solar is certainly an emerging technology. Uh, and this concept of peer influence meaning that uh, the actions of peers can affect the decisions of other peers has been very thoroughly documented for rooftop solar. Uh, it's been one of the, the high level consistent findings in the literature. Uh, it's often, been, at least pre-pandemic, uh, it was talked about as contagion. Uh, the rooftop solar is contagious and spreads from household to household. Uh, and we're just adding to that with uh, some new insights. So we make some improvements on existing peer influence models, which I'll talk about. And our key contribution here is evaluating influence across household income levels, uh, which we're able to do because of the data that Galen just mentioned and I'll touch on later on. Three key findings, uh, the key takeaways here, peer influence affects household adoption decisions at all income levels. Uh, that much is, is very clear. 
Uh, influence has a quantitatively weaker impact on adoption rates among low-income households. And I'll get into the details of, of exactly why that is. And uh, probably what is the, the key finding of the paper, influence is stronger within income groups than across income groups. So for instance, the influence of a low-income household or low-income household is more strongly influenced if they see, say, solar on another low-income household uh, than if they are to see uh, solar on a high-income household or interact with or et cetera. And I'll, I'll get a bit into exactly what influence means later on. So with some background, this question, what drives rooftop solar? There's a lot of research on this question, a lot of interest to see what drives adoption decisions uh, in order to advance and 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 accelerate uh, rooftop solar deployment. Most of that research looks at uh, individual households and tries to understand what drove that household to adopt. Uh, it's kind of the typical rational actor model. Individual households face incentives. They respond to those incentives and decide whether or not to adopt. That's what most research does. Then there's this other research that says, well, rooftop solar adoption decisions depend on the adoption decisions of their peers. So this fits into a body of literature that goes by various names, often it's social influence. Here we use the term peer influence uh, to specifically mean that the decisions of one household depend on the decisions of people in their peer network, be it neighbors, friends, relatives, et cetera. Uh, so under this model, we're looking at how do the adoption decisions of households interact with one another. Another key piece of background set up this study is solar diffusion and specifically solar diffusion over income levels. So rooftop solar, just like any other emerging technology or most emerging technologies, is becoming more equitable over time, meaning that right now it is not equitable in the sense that it is disproportionately adopted by relatively high income households. This plot here shows this. This plot now is a, a couple of years old, so that the trend is continued. But looking over time, um, the metric here is the percent of adopters earning less than the national median income. So if solar were randomly distributed across the country, we'd expect the number to be 50%. Uh, a couple of decades ago, it was well under 10%. So uh, LMI, low and moderate income households, were underrepresented by something like 40 percentage points. It slowly crept up over time. By 2020, it was up inching towards 20%. I'd imagine it's it's around there now. And the, the key point here is solar diffuses into the population. It's going to reach higher and higher income households for a variety of reasons. Uh, one big one is that the cost of solar has come down uh, considerably over time. Uh, but one idea that we had is, well, peer influence could also play into this process. If solar, say, is adopted early on in a relatively affluent neighborhood, uh, this idea of peer influence would suggest that the neighbors of that initial adopter will adopt themselves. Those neighbors are likewise going to be relatively affluent households. Uh, so this process of peer influence can reinforce some of these patterns in, in adoption inequity, which is a term we use just to describe the fact that low-income households are underrepresented among solar adopters. Um, as Galen mentioned, we have a ton more research on, on this LMI ad adoption, rooftop solar adoption equity. Um, it's just a bit of background for the sake of this presentation. So in this paper, we look at two specific research questions. Uh, does peer influence operate at all income levels? Uh, so in the past, there was some look at income, uh, but it's generally looking at differences in income across uh, geographic units, such as zip codes. Here we're gonna look at, does influence operate differently at different income levels at the household level? And could differences in peer influence partly explain these differences in adoption? that I described in the, the previous slide. So typically I tend to burn through uh, methodology in webinars. Um, I'm going to hover around uh, methods and modeling for a couple slides. 
partly because with peer influence, it just takes some convincing that we can actually do this, that we can actually measure it. And uh, the results themselves understood in that context can become a bit more intuitive. But I'm going to try to keep this uh, as simple as I can. And it's not as intimidating as it, as it might look right now. So jogging your memories back to Econ 101, uh, typically we can think of demand being a function of price in this equation, you know, demand, quantity demanded Q is a function of price. And then this X for a bunch of other stuff. So it's a function of price. And then these idiosyncratic factors that, that creates demand. The theory of peer influence suggests that demand is also a function of the demand of other people. So my demand for solar is a function of my neighbor's demand for solar. If I see that my neighbor has adopted, maybe that makes me want to adopt more or less or whatever it is. But the fact is that the demand of one person is a function of another person's demand. So if we say that on the left side, that blue quantity demanded is a function of the right side, the demand of others, uh, the impact of the demand of others on the demand of others in the peer group is known as a peer effect. So we're going to say, typically this is done within a geographic area. We say that the demand of a household living in some neighborhood is a function of the demand of all the other households in that neighborhood. And then we can measure that as what's called a, a peer effect. Uh, that's all well and good. We actually have to figure out some way to estimate this. And this goes back to initial work done in 2012 by these folks, uh, Brian Bollinger and Ken Gillingham. Uh, Ken advised a good deal in this work, and I happen to see that Brian is in the audience. So happy to see the interest uh, from these two that continue contributing tons of work and on influence in this space. Uh, but we build on their model. So they developed this approach for identifying peer effects in the context of rooftop solar. And the not to get into the weeds, but their key insight here was that there's a gap between when a household decides to adopt and when the household actually installs solar. That gap is usually several weeks or months. So if I decide today in December, I want to adopt rooftop solar, I'm probably installing in January or February. And that's really important because that separation in time means that I can model a demand and adoption decision as a function of an installation, which represents an adoption that happened several months back. That gap needs to be long enough for various statistical reasons, but under conditions that we can show, we can show that we can model all this through a regression. So the regression is simply taking adoption decisions today or at some time, saying that is a function of all the number of installations in that area. And the subscripts here um, are just for whatever geography or time period you want to use. In our case, we use census tracts. <clears throat> and then this model, the only point is that that beta, you know, the, the Greek character, is going to give us some quantitative estimate of how much the number of installs in one's neighborhood affects the probability that that household adopts solar. We implement all of this uh, with rooftop solar adopter data. Um, it's provided by BuildZoom. Um, it's part of the solar demographics data that Galen mentioned. A key aspect of this and kind of the novelty here is that we have access to modeled household level income estimates. Uh, that's in bold, just to emphasize they're modeled data. Uh, therefore, we know that they're wrong, but they're correct on average. And we have something like 800,000 records, large sample size, model data. Uh, through various previous studies, we've been able to verify that this is a pretty valid approach. As I mentioned, we define these peer groups as census tracts. Um, and to do this, it's done in a tract day level, which means that the full sample is something like 83 million data points. It's a pretty cumbersome method, uh, but all I want to do there is just you know, drill home that we're working with a very large sample here. Just to take a look at where the study sample comes from, uh, 
as with all rooftop solar research, heavily concentrated in California. It's always something to bear in mind, uh, as well, well as a relatively few key markets across the country. And we take two approaches. Um, so I mentioned that really what it comes down to is a regression, but still you need to figure out how do we identify when a household adopted and when a household installed. That adoption is particularly tricky because we don't observe the day that someone wakes up and says, fine, you know what, I, 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 want, to I want to install solar, today is the day, uh, that's unobservable. So we always need some proxy for that date. And different researchers over time have figured out different ways to do that. We offer a slight improvement. So consistent with other studies, our proxy is the day that a, a system or an installer applies for a permit. We observe that date of the permit application. But we also have research that gives us some sense of how much further back in time the adoption happened. So what we do is take the observed application date, we subtract uh, something like 15 days, I don't have the number off the top of my head, subtract some day to get an imputed adoption date. So we think we're getting closer to the actual date that uh, a household decided to adopt. Likewise with installation, uh, it's generally difficult to observe, meaning in data, the date that a system was installed. So we impute that in a similar way. We do have good reliable dates when permits were issued. And again, through previous research, this done by the National Renewable Energy Lab, we can have some sense of the average number of days it takes to move from when that permit was issued until the system was installed. So we move that date forward, and now we have an imputed installation date an imputed adoption date. And essentially what we're doing is modeling imputed installations, the effects of those on imputed adoptions. Really, this is the same as all other peer effects models in the past, in case you're familiar with those. We just think we're getting closer to the actual date. We also offer a, a kind of a bigger change, which is to say, instead of trying to home in on just one date, uh, we can think about, well, we don't really know for sure when a household adopted or installed. So we can reflect that uncertainty and say, well, we think it's around this date based on when the system applied for a permit or was issued a permit. We can take, again, the data from NREL and we build these continuous probability distributions to say, for instance, uh, there was a 20% chance that this household adopted on a specific date, uh, maybe it's 15% the next day, et cetera. So in any given day, there's a probability that a household installed or adopted. That one is a much different approach. It's more complicated. Even explaining it just now, I, I felt like it was, it was probably too complex to get into, and I won't. So I'm, I'm going to focus on this first approach, which is just based on discrete dates. And last methodological slide. Uh, we, just like other models, we used a fixed effects regression. All the details are, of course, in the article if you really want to dig into them. Um, and then the key last bit of context is we test influence across income levels by subsetting into LMI and non-LMI. There are lots of different ways to define LMI, low and moderate income. Uh, we use this metric earning less than 100% of the area median income. So any household that earns less than area median income is defined as LMI. Anyone earning more is defined as non-LMI. Uh, we test variations on that and it doesn't make a huge difference where we define the cutoff. So it's just a heuristic for LMI. All right, so the results. Uh, focusing first on just the effects on all households to just setting aside income for a second. Uh, we get this estimate from the discrete date model that each installation increases the probability of adoption by around 1.8 percentage points. Um, it's a pretty large effect. 
for context, the initial work by Bollinger and, Bollinger and Gillingham uh, you know, roughly a decade ago, uh, their kind of preferred point estimate was 0 0.8 points. So same order, same ballpark. Uh, totally to be expected, our number would be a bit higher. We're working with a much larger market uh, over the past decade than that initial study. And just the only note I'll say about the continuous probability model is that we get a much larger estimated effect. That model suggests that every installation drives, every two installations drives roughly one peer influence adoption. That seems a bit difficult to digest that that would be possible, but this comes back to this question of what is peer influence? And like any other model, we do not specify a mechanism. Meaning all we are doing is measuring this statistical association between previous installations and current adoptions. We don't know why that association exists. Uh, through various statistical techniques, we believe it is causal, but we don't know the mechanism. We don't know if it's because a household sees a panel, interacts with a neighbor, if there's some active persuasion. And the big one is um, referrals. So referrals are a very, very common marketing technique in the solar industry something like a third to a half, depending on the time of install install or customers are acquired through referrals. And in a way you can think about a referral as a subsidized peer effect. It's essentially convincing one current adopter to refer another adopter. Uh, and that is probably one reason why that second number is believable. Uh, but like I said, we, we we're going to focus on the discrete date model to look very specifically at the, the immediate effects of, of peer influence uh, at the, the discrete date level. So now again, so what's really novel here is the peer effects across income levels. And this is the kind of the, the second of the key conclusions. Peer effects are significantly smaller among LMI households. So the plot here shows percentage point changes in adoption probabilities. Um, like I said, the whole uh, population of 1.8 LMI is far less, something like 0 0.2 versus non-LMI uh, 1.4 or so. Uh, a really, really substantial difference. So I'll, I'll just present the result now and I'll, I'll get into some of the discussion about why that is in a second. Um, and then I, as I said, I think this is really the, the key finding of the study. Peer effects are stronger within than across income groups. So looking at LMI adoption, uh, the, the effects of previous LMI installations on LMI adoptions are stronger than the effects of non-LMI installations on LMI adoptions. Uh, and, and likewise uh, for non-LMI. And again, just presenting the results now, uh, I'll get into in a second what we think about them. <clears throat> and, and one thing to maybe adjust for is the fact that, uh, as I mentioned, LMI households in general are just underrepresented among solar adopters. So it'd be nice to adjust for that, uh, those differences in background adoption rates, just to see if that's sort of explaining some of these differences. Uh, doing that, we see that LMI, these effects, these peer effects are still smaller among LMI households. They don't get wiped out by controlling for those differences in background adoption rates. Um, but the within group effects are, are much more similar. So not still not the same, they're still weaker, uh, but at least some of this is attributable to differences in background adoption rates. So now to unpack some of these results, what explains this fact that we see weaker LMI peer effects. And here it's definitely worth stopping and, and thinking, reassessing what exactly is a peer effect. Uh, when we say this in a model, we're referring to a quantitative measurement. We can only model what we observe and measure, meaning that a household has to install solar for it to show up in our data set. The reason I'm saying that is because uh, you can imagine uh, an LMI household, say, seeing a neighbor install solar and thinking, grand, I'm, I'm going to call up an installer. Uh, 
uh, their influence to install solar. There is pure influence there. But then it comes to that moment of speaking to the installer, the installer gives them a quote, say $20,000, um, and the LMI household maybe can't get access to a loan or whatever barrier exists, and they just decide not to adopt. So the influence was real, but it didn't result in an installed system, so we can't measure it. And our kind of hypothesis is that's really what's going on here. Our intuition is that LMI households are not receptive, not less receptive to influence. It's just that influence doesn't overcome these other barriers to LMI adoption. Budget constraint being a big one, uh, differences in home ownership. So again, uh, LMI households are more likely to rent or live in multifamily housing. Uh, if an LMI renter, for instance, is inspired to adopt solar, that's great. But if they don't own, home, own their home, they probably cannot adopt solar. So the influence doesn't result in an installation and we can't measure it. So it's all to say that influence may be some interesting mechanism to help spur LMI adoption, but it doesn't address any other barriers. So it only goes so far. And then the second point, why is peer influence stronger within income groups? I suppose this is intuitive. Uh, there's plenty of research in the social influence literature to explain why this is. And it's it comes down to the intuitive result that individuals just identify with other individuals with like characteristics. Uh, and thinking about this, it makes a lot of sense. If say you're a low income household living in a mixed income neighborhood, and you see the mansion down the street, install solar, that's great. Uh, but maybe you're thinking, well, of course they can. You know, the house that always has the expensive cars or whatever, that has no influence on what I can do uh, and within my budget constraints. Much different being the same low-income household and seeing one of your neighbors that you know is kind of at the same you know, socioeconomic status, and thinking, yes, uh, actually, you know, if they can do it, of course I can do it. And going to talk to them, getting equipped, uh, getting knowledgeable about solar adoption. Um, so it's just perhaps much more empowering. And you know, at this point, these are hypotheses, but uh, these are ideas that we throw out in the paper and explore more in depth. So just to reiterate with conclusions, and then we'll have, as Gayla mentioned, plenty of time for Q&A. So again, throwing your questions in there. Uh, peer influence affects adoption at all income levels. Uh, peer effects are weaker at lower income levels. But again, reiterate, that does not necessarily mean that influence is less important. It just means influence is less likely to translate to adoption. At least that's our hypothesis. Uh, influence is stronger within than across income groups. And this last point, I didn't really get into it, but it's, it's just a, a note maybe for researchers is that it's influence is strong enough in these models um, that it should always be something considered in, in analyses of what drives rooftop solar adoption decisions. Um, right, so flash some acknowledgements from our funders and the, the various folks that advised on this work. And uh, we'll put our contact info up here. With that, we'll go to questions. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, so yeah, we've got Plenty of time here for Q&A. Um, there are a few questions that folks have submitted, but definitely encourage others to submit more. Um, and many of these initial ones are um, kind of fairly basic logistical ones that I can uh, hopefully just click through and give Eric a break. Um, so first, uh, uh, somebody asked where uh, you can find the link to the, the full publication. So I, I did insert that into the chat window. Um, so hopefully all of you see that. Um, so that that's where you can find the publication. That's also where we will post a recording of the webinar uh, and the webinar slides. Um, so I know there was a, another person asked um, whether and, and how they might get a hold of the, the slides from the webinar. So that, that's where they'll go. Uh, next question is household size included? Um, and so I assume that means is one of the kind of control variables in the regression. Um, yeah, um, it is not. So yeah, may maybe if you want to respond to that with uh, some thoughts on, on why you, you think household size maybe should have been included 
uh, throw that into the Q and A. Yeah, I guess, and it's not. Yeah, I, and I assume that means the number the number of yeah uh, individuals in the home. Uh, next question, also just kind of a basic uh, mechanical one. Do you have solar installation data at ad uh, at address level? Um, and the answer is yes. So yeah, the um, the solar adopter demographics data that we assemble for our annual report uh, and that we have used uh, at least in part for the paper here is address level data. So we've got street addresses for each solar installation. And then we are able to, as Eric mentioned, append on to those addresses, household level income estimates and, and other, other demographic information as well. Um, so that's that's kind of what part of our secret sauce here, I guess, is that we've got that that address level data. Um, next question: Is there a link to the slides? Yes, there is, or there will be. I'll, we'll we'll post that on the publication page, and we'll also try to remember to send out an email to all of you, um, directing you to that link. Uh, next question. Uh, so are you saying there is currently no measure for abandonment for LMI homeowners who attempt but fail slash abandon their attempt? Yeah, this is an interesting question. There has been research on abandonment. Uh, it's in that research, they were called considerers. These are people that considered but did not ultimately adopt as I recall, that research did not look at differences across income levels. I might be wrong about that. Um, so I don't think there's research specifically on what causes LMI households who want to adopt to abandon. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Uh, I assume this peer influence is changing over time. Does your work consider this? Um, no. Uh, you are. You would be correct. <laughs> I don't know that the nature of influence changes over time, but certainly there are more and more installations, so that will change the influence of any specific install. And just as we move from early adopters to late adopters, uh, the way they are going to be influenced will change. I'll let my cat out. You can cut that out of the, the, the YouTube video. <laughs> um, great, next question. Uh, I may have missed it, but what role does proximity play to generating influence? For example, if someone down to down the street installs PV, how does this influence adoption? Yeah, so really good question. We don't get into this in the study, uh, but some of the folks I mentioned earlier on, Bollinger and Gillingham, they have done work looking more specifically at proximity. The, the effects we look at are within the census tract level, so it's pretty small. Uh, the implication there is that if you live near someone you are probably you're much more likely to either see the panel or interact with them. And other work does show that the visibility of panels matters. So that proximity will increase the chance that you see them. And that's really what we think is, is driving this. Okay. Uh, next question. Did you examine or review other studies regarding the affordability or economic viability? to explain the lower adoption levels by LMI households. Yeah, so th this is really referring to a lot of the other work that we do. Uh, and like I said, in this specific study, it's really just context, this LMI and, and adoption and diffusion. But uh, I'd encourage everyone here to, to you know plug our other work, just Google Berkeley Lab Solar Demographics, we have lots of studies there that look at questions like that. Yeah, and I'll 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 drop the kind of um, the link for our main solar demographics webpage in here uh, in a second, where you can access kind of all all we, where we've organized a lot of the publications in this area. Um, uh, next question here: uh, the no money upfront solar lease option from Posigen. 
has helped remove some of the barriers in Philadelphia. Is there any data on how leasing options helps LMI adopters? There is. So we have done previous research on exactly this question. It was several years ago now, um, but we found persuasive evidence that leasing does uh, increase LMI adoption for exactly that reason. So by removing upfront cost barriers, uh, it's a specifically useful option for LMI households. Uh, next question, can we access the data as a CSV file? Um, I think you did, I mean, the, the journal article, there is a um, kind of a, a data, a, an associated data file. I'm not sure what sort of granularity we provided there. Yeah, so we cannot share the household level income estimates. That That's the ultimate constraint here. Uh, if you go to the landing page of this paper, there are some data and scripts, everything that we could share. But really, the, the probably the most useful data resource, again, is at the Solar Demographics homepage. And there's a data visualization tool that you can find. And we have several CSVs there that go down to the track level uh, with income estimates. And I'm just <clears throat> grabbing that web page here, for folks. So yeah, from I just dropped into the chat our the the website for our main solar demographics web page um, where you can access the tool that Eric just mentioned, our tracking report, and then the full publication list for um, all or at least most most of the work that we've done in this area. Uh, next question is the demographic data longitudinal or just a snapshot? Uh, it's a snapshot. And this is something that we often talk about in terms of limitations of working with this data. Uh, the big one is income. Every year we get an income estimate of the household as of that year. So if they adopted in 2015, we're using their income in 2020 in this case, or 2022, whenever the, the year is. Um, so so it's a, it's a limitation. In, or, or not thinking about depending on look at it when we talk more about that in the paper. Okay, great. Um, next, we've got a couple questions here. Uh, number one, if the impact of peer influence raises adoption by 1.8%, um, that's kind of the number that we cited, what is the base adoption rate? Um, if the base adoption rate is very low, like 2%, that would double the likelihood but if 40%, then the impact is less significant. So I think maybe the question is just sort of um, asking wh whether that um, sort of characterization is, is correct. Yeah, uh, the base adoption rate is very low. So these are in units of 10 to the negative six. So bumping the, the decimal point back six places, the adoption rate, and it, it sort of makes sense if you think about it. On a given day in a tract, it's highly unlikely if you threw a dart at a dartboard of 365 days, you're going to land on one where someone happens to be installing. Um, and to reiterate that 1.8, it's 1.8 points. It's not 1.8%, it's 1. Point points. I, I, just to make that clear. So you're going from what the probability is like just barely above zero and saying on that date, it increased by 1.8 points. It's characterize it's it's weird to think about that sounding big um but but Brian who I see has a a, a comment in the Q a and their initial research they they were all able to assure us that it is actually quite large um by peer influence standards uh another question um from the same individual uh just kind of a data clarification question why why is there so much data for Wisconsin? But so little for surrounding states. Just curious. So I, I had to, I saw that, and I had to look. So it's Minnesota, um, not Wisconsin. But <laughs> in, in any event, um, Minnesota just happens to have. Th this is one of the weird things about rooftop solar in general. That once you get into this space, uh, rooftop solar does not necessarily follow the sun. It's just mostly based on policy. Minnesota. Uh, 
at, at least for years, had a relatively attractive policy and just a, an active market. So that's one reason. Another reason is just the way our data work. So we are data constrained by where we collect. If you look at this map, it's, this does really accurately reflect active solar markets, um, but to some extent it does just reflect where we're able to get data from. Um, yeah. so that's it. Yeah, and, and, and for this study, we were relying, as Eric mentioned, on um, data that we purchased from BillZoom, which is, is, is itself sourced from uh, mostly from uh, local permitting agencies. Um, and so their, you know, their data collection is not, you know, totally comprehensive. It's, I mean, they, they cover, a, you know, a very large fraction of all solar permits that are issued each year. Um, but there are some states and parts of the country where, uh, for whatever reason, um, their, their coverage is less complete. And so some of these weird discontinuities that you see, you know, comparing, say, for example, Minnesota to you know parts of Wisconsin that are just over the border. Some of that might just be due to kind of data availability um, constraints in terms of, of where Bill Zoom is collecting this permit data from. <clears throat> um, next, we've got just a, a comment from Brian that I'll share with the rest of the group here. Um, uh, he says, uh, we, and this is referring to a paper that, that he and others published uh, last year, found effects of non-visible panels at less than 100 meters, but visible ones at at, at, uh, at at least one kilometer. So in other words, if the panel is, is visible, um, then there are uh, peer effects that that uh, extend out, you know, up to one kilometer from, from the, the system. Um, whereas if the panels are not visible, then the effects are much, much more localized. Uh, less than 100 meters, basically, you know, the, the the neighboring houses, but not much beyond. Um, okay, let's see, we got a couple more questions here. Uh, next one, uh, and this is from someone at SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, says, uh, we at SMUD have found that a contributing barrier challenge to LMI adoption of rooftop PV is the condition of the roof. Uh, which in many cases are poor and or in need of repair. This may be difficult to incorporate into your study. Maybe there is something to infer regarding home ownership and or income level. Thoughts? Uh, we have many. We are thinking about this constantly. Uh, so home ownership is a tough one, mostly because our sample is almost entirely homeowners. So I mentioned early on um, renters, in particular, just have a really hard time adopting rooftop solar. We have very few renters in our data set. So that's that's one part. We also, the vast majority of the data points and adopters for that matter, live in single family homes. We have good reason to believe that a lot of the adopters that live in multifamily homes in our data set refers to duplexes, not larger multifamily buildings. So yeah, I agree with your your idea here that we could use something like home ownership as a proxy, but it's just so homogenous at this point uh, in solar adoption that it isn't very useful. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. We we can think about if we have other proxies for roof conditions. Um, so it, it's it's a good suggestion and it's definitely something we're thinking about. Um. All right, uh, let's see, two more questions here. Have you looked at whether the number of existing solar installations or the adoption rate in the area impact the peer influence that you're measuring? Um, I suppose this is sort of similar to the idea of peer influences changing over time. If I understand the correct the question correctly, it's does peer, the magnitude of influence on the margin change as there are more systems in the installed base. Yeah. Uh, my hunch to throw it out would be that it increases because solar is just diffusing more rapidly and maybe seeing one system installed in your neighborhood is, is like, yeah, fine. Of course, that person would do that because they always do it, but versus seeing the 15th system installed in your neighborhood and thinking, fine, I'll do it. 
You know, there, that, I, I think there's an accumulating effect at the margin. Um, so it's an interesting idea to to look into. And then yeah. I, that the last one just seems to be a, an interest in Oklahoma City, but yes, um, noting a concentration there. Yeah, I mean, I think um, certainly some of the patterns that we see in the map here are also just a reflection of where humans live. <laughs> so denser, denser, more populated areas have more dots. Uh, yeah. um, all righty, well, that is it in terms of the question. So thanks everybody for, for joining and for participating. This was really um, interesting to um, just hear the questions that you all have. Definitely gives us more uh, stuff to chew on. And I think unless there are any final remarks, Eric, that you want to have, we can just um, bid everyone farewell and, and uh, thank you all for joining us. We'll look, we look forward to the, the next webinar. Sure. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Right,